Well, we don't have anybody waiting to get in, so uh, let's go ahead and get started and welcome to the Woodworkers Guild meeting. Uh, another in the series of video meetings. Uh, we're going to cover a bunch of things pretty quickly here tonight. I hope everybody got a hold of the newsletter and had an opportunity to read it. There's a lot of information in there this month. Uh, we've got an awful lot of things going on all at one time. Some of it deals with the end of the fiscal year and uh, some of it deals with just uh, things popping up and breaking loose at the same time. So uh, if you don't, if you didn't get a copy of the newsletter or you deleted it or whatever, you can find it on the website. If you go to the website and then click on news and then go down and newsletters are in there. And uh, a newsletter is going clear back, what, 10 or 12 years, David, something like that or on the website. So uh, if you're new and you want to see what the, the Guild's been doing over that time period, uh, you can go back through there. Uh, a lot of interesting show and tell and that type of thing. So uh, don't forget that they're on the website. Uh, we're starting this desk program. Uh, these are small desks. Uh, Should have got a photograph of it in the newsletter and intended uh, for kids in first and second grade to give them a place to study at home. And uh, these desks are going to uh, be relatively easy to build once we get all of the, uh, the bugs worked out of the manufacturing system. A group of uh, people were out at the shop yesterday and figuring out the best way to manufacture them. Uh, they went in with one idea and uh, I got an email yesterday evening that uh, with the modifications they were going to make to the manufacturing process. They'll be meeting again next week. And after that, we'll probably be ready to have uh, groups of people come out to the shop and build some desks. Uh, we've budgeted for 150 desks. We're going to start with uh, some smaller quantities just so we can build them in batches, basically. Uh, make sure we can get them in the back of folks' pickup trucks and then get them over to Bring Me a Book St. Louis. Uh, they're going to be distributing the books uh, to start this program. So it's going to be a major project. And as soon as we need people to be building desks out at the shop, we'll send out an email looking for volunteers. And it'll probably work in four-hour shifts and during the week or on any weekends when we have free shop days. Uh, on weekends, it's uh, pretty booked up out there with open hours for the members in the shop and then the classes we've got scheduled, but we'll try to get them all worked in. So in addition to the uh, desk, we're looking to build a storage shed out at Faust Park. Uh, the park is cleaning off an area. They've got a little bit of it cleaned off. And as soon as we get the uh, area cleaned off, we're going to order all the materials and then we'll be looking to... Uh, build a storage shed out there and need volunteers for that. It's going to be approximately the size of one car garage. So we'll have plenty of room for toys and some additional storage, uh, get things out of the, uh, the wood shop there in Faust Park. Uh, elections are uh, coming up. Uh, you should have got an email concerning elections. And if you uh, didn't get one and you want one, let me know and I'll make sure you get an email. Uh, but that went out uh, last week. And we're looking to have a swap meet, uh, probably be in June is our uh, target date right now. And uh, folks can bring stuff out to Faust Park and one of the parking lots out there and uh, see if they can buy, sell, or swap whatever they brought. And we're also going to probably pull some equipment out of the barn back there and have it for sale and see if we can get some of that stuff moved out of the barn. Uh, that would make uh, everybody involved in that project happy, as well as Faust Park, get that stuff out of there. Uh, we're also going to do a survey concerning when we get back together uh, with an in-person meeting. And that'll probably get done this month. Uh, we would go back to meeting over at Shriners. They've said we can come back and meet over there. We'll just have to find out what the willingness of people is to go back and meet in person. Now, the one thing that we will do if we go back and meet in person over there, of course, we'll maintain distance. We'll encourage everybody to wear a mask and we will be live streaming the meetings. And uh, we'll have a, I think it's a three camera setup 
and you'll be able to set it home on your computer, go to YouTube and watch a live stream of the meeting. And uh, until everybody's very comfortable getting back out in public and in, in the groups, uh, that may be the best thing uh, for some of you out there. Uh, we'll also be uh, recording those meetings and they will be available if you can't uh, watch them on the live stream that night. So looking forward to uh, getting back to that. Uh, Bill Shukat, uh, we've got a bunch of classes scheduled. You want to kind of go over what's coming up in the next month? <clears throat> Excuse me, next month. Hello, Bill. Sorry about that. The dog was barking. Um, we've got about a total of about 25 classes scheduled. In April, there are three classes. April 1st, we have uh, another safety class. April 3rd, we have a class on sharpening. April 4th, we have a class on making your own diamond sharpening stone. Uh, in May, there are five classes scheduled, one on pen turning, one making toy trucks, uh, another safety class, um, a class on how to sharpen a handsaw, and another class on finishing with shellac and oil. All of those classes uh, are on the website, and you can sign up unless they're already full. Uh, I've sent out a, an email tonight to all the class instructors um, with the changes in the restrictions in St. Louis County. Uh, we're evaluating changing the maximum number of students in a class from four and increasing it to six. Um, but that's going to be with the permission of the individual instructor. So uh, if you see, if you check in and see a class that's got four um, and you want to go, go into the class, check back in a day or two, because uh, it may increase depending on the instructor that's involved. Next. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Um, Safety classes will also be increased from four to six, most likely. So uh, all of that should be happening uh, this week, over the weekend, that type of thing. Uh, Vicki, you got a report on the toys? I do. Thank you, Wayne. Um, March last week, I think it was, we had a uh, collection point and only collected 330 toys. It doesn't sound like much from what we've been doing, but four of our seven recipients have put a temporary hold on what we uh, can give to them. So we're still in good shape and our, our uh, inventory is uh, satisfactory. But one of the things we want to do is encourage more members to contribute. And in part that is because regularly we only receive contributions from eight to 10 of our members. And when you look at a membership of well over 200, you know, we'd like to see that expanded. So one of the things are, one of the two things we wanna do is to start a program that would encourage new toy contributors. And we would enter anyone who has not contributed um, before 2020, so 2020 and through today, if you do contribute 10 or more items, we'll put you in a drawing at the end of September for a gift card or for gift cards. So hopefully that will be a little incentive to get uh, more of our members contributing. And secondly, to encourage maybe beginners who aren't so sure of their skill sets or what they should be doing, we're gonna have a series of how-to videos on toy building. And they'll be relatively simple items, at least to start. Perhaps we'll make them more complex as time moves on. Um, but it would require just minimal equipment that you might already have at home and not need to go into the guild. But each video will contain tips on 
on building that would be applicable to really all toys in general. So we've done, we've done one and we will be uh, getting an email out when that's readily available to everyone. You see this, Gail? She's gonna be our new president. <laughs> yes, as long as there are no other write-ins, I will be it. So thank you. But uh, to just to give you a few more numbers of what we did, we did collect 330 <laughs> items and delivered 225. So that puts our year-to-date year -date delivery at 1,214. And from inception, or since we've been counting since 1994, we've exceeded 76,000 toys. So, you know, I think that's one of the reasons that this organization has appealed to me and I hope touches the hearts of others. It's such a great opportunity to give back. We've got a few that are over the, over exceeding themselves and that was all in the newsletter and I think that's all my, I have on our numbers but just uh, if you're thinking about being a contributor we hope that some of the tools that we're setting up and incentives we're setting up will encourage you to participate so thanks that's all thanks Vicki uh, show and tell uh, I'm constantly amazed over the last few months at the number of uh people that send things in, the photographs, and it's encouraging to know how many of our members are building big things out there in the world, and I'm impressed with all of that. But we've also got a video of uh, some other things. Uh, the show and tell video is not just show and tell this month, there's an instructional section to it. So uh, we'll go ahead and play that. Hal, you wanna play it? Okay, Chief. Um... We got uh, three people, I think, in this one, and I appreciate everybody who comes out to Faust Park on those days and uh, brings their their latest projects with them, and it, uh, it's going to work out great. Here we go. Uh, the name is Rich Sanders. We got a couple of small items here for this month. With Easter coming up, I thought it'd be a good time for the, the little bunny here. Uh, if anybody is interested, I'll have to find out where my drawing is of what I did with this, but I'll be glad to pass it along to just give me a ring. Uh, it really wasn't that bad to do. Spends more time working the, the different colors in and stuff like that. But uh, if you got any small grandkids or whatever, that's an ideal toy. Going back about a year ago, I had one of these at the, uh, Christmas dinner that we did. Only the one I had done then was half the size of this one, and it was a bear to do. So this is actually the full size version here. And if you got any golfers in the family, this would be the ideal piece to have. Just give me a holler. That's good. Hi everybody, Brian Ellison here. Uh, a year or so ago, uh, a guy was at a meeting talking about 3D printing adapters uh, for your vacuum system. Well, I do have a 3D printer and I make these. Well, you have to design them, you have to print them, and the thing took seven hours to print. So what I'm gonna show you here is how to make an adapter in less than five minutes. As you can see, these are adapters that I have made for other pieces of my machinery. Um, doesn't take any time at all. I label them. That's my two inch splice, my delta sander. I didn't measure through that one, but it's really easy. I have a wonderful $10 Harbor Freight heat gun. And all I do is sit here and I just heat it up. I go inside and outside. And what I'm gonna do here for this one here is I made a new drill press fence and I need to adapt, get one of the, this adapter that fits over this. My two inch hose is this size and I'm gonna make it fit. So my two inch hose will fit onto that adapter. Wear a glove because this is really hot. And just keep moving it around. Keep feeling it, because it does not take long for this thing to start moving on you. I 
and I could get it hotter and get it to go on, but there it is right there. Uh, I'm Bill Shukat. Um, in the past, I've made a lot of toys uh, and built furniture. Actually, I have a furniture project um, in the shop now that is getting nearing completion. But I decided I wanted to try something a little bit different with a little more of a challenge. So I've in, embarked on what will probably be a long project uh, where I'm going to build a violin. But I started off making a template, made this out of uh, eighth inch Baltic birch, cut that out and used it uh, as a half mold to make um, what's called the mold, which you build the violin around. Start off with a um, plywood piece and you cut some corners and in, glue in some uh, blocks. These blocks are made out of willow. Once you get them glued in and the glue dried, um, then you uh, get out your carving tools and you make it the shape uh, that the sides of the violin are gonna fit to. Yesterday, I glued up what will be the back of the violin um, I glued this with hot hide melt glue, which I'd never used before. I bought these pieces from a violin maker in South St. Louis. Um, milled them up a little bit, got the joint to fit, uh, put the glue on it. So the next step is on the front to smooth that out and get in the curvature um that's intended and put the pattern on it and cut out the, sh the shape so i expect this is gonna be a long time coming um lots to learn but it's been fun so far uh intermingled with that i bought one of these wine stoppers um at rockler uh, and bought uh, a piece of Paduk that I turned uh, over the weekend uh, and mounted the stopper on. Uh, it isn't quite the shape that I wish it was, so I'm going to have to make some more and refine that effort a little bit. That's it. Thanks, Al. Uh, appreciate Hal's effort in shooting these videos and editing these videos. Uh, having seen uh, the raw footage on a couple of these videos, there's a little more editing goes on sometimes than what you might think that there is. And, uh, we've shot a number of other videos and some of them be released, some of them be on uh, YouTube, uh, links on the website, that type of stuff. And uh, we hope to continue doing that. Uh, one of the things we'd like to do is to shoot videos on how to use each individual piece of equipment that's in our wood shop. And so if you're going out and you want to use a piece of equipment you're not familiar with, you could go and uh, go to the YouTube channel and see an instructional video on the particular piece of equipment that we have in our shop. So thanks again, Hal. Uh, uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight. Our speaker is uh, Jeffrey Seitz. Uh, those of you that uh, came in at 645 or thereabouts, uh, we're hearing him talk a little bit. But, Jeffrey's a violin maker, and he's been doing that for better than 25 years. A two-time national fiddle champion. Uh, that's kind of the thing I'm impressed with. But uh, Jeffrey spoke to us uh, probably four years ago or so. But with all the new members uh, we have, uh, we thought it was time to bring him back. So, uh, Jeffrey, I'll turn this thing over to you. All right. And I guess I'm unmuted now, so uh, ready to begin. So like he says, my name is Jeffrey Seitz, and uh, I have this violin shop down in South St. Louis uh, at like Loughborough and Morgan Ford. <clears throat> We've been there for about 33, 34 years. I've actually been in this business for over 40 years. And uh, I started out uh, apprenticing with one guy, his name is Glenn T. Stockton, and his shop was in Spokane, Washington. 
and uh, apprenticed with him and learned, uh, learned how to make instruments, uh, violins, and also how to repair them. And, and he was a good appraiser too. So I've learned some appraising. And then along the way, uh, for all, throughout all these years, I've worked with a couple of other uh, violin makers and got things from them and uh, did a lot of research on my own about stuff. And, uh, you know, kind of when it comes to identifying uh, musical instruments, string instruments, and especially violins, it's tricky. It, uh, they all kind of look the same. So you have to, uh, I always say it's kind of like being in the mafia. You know, you have to, you have to see a whole bunch of them to, to know what's going on. You, you have to be kind of a made man, you know, <laughs> to learn. A friend of mine in Chicago used to say, it's like, it's like a guy being a Volkswagen nut. If he's a Volkswagen nut, he sees a Volkswagen come down the road. He knows what year it was made and what city it was built in and all this kind of, well, that's kind of the way I am about uh, violins and violas and cellos and even guitars and mandolins and stuff. So anyway, uh, I'm going to just hold up some stuff. Uh, I, that little video that Bill did there, uh, he kind of got a little, got a little taste of what was going on there. And I'm going to, uh, explain some of the things about it. Uh, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to talk about stuff. It's always been intimidating to kind of talk in front of the woodworkers guild, because I know there's all you guys are just incredible workers. And if I say something that's really basic and beginner like stuff, please excuse me but i'm just gonna do it you know i'm just gonna say what uh what i know and uh you may uh, know it all already so anyhow uh we'll start out here uh i make violins violas cellos i've made some guitars i've made some other weird little like dulcimer like things and some other instruments like that before but i mostly uh, mostly focus in on the bowed instruments okay and so I'm going to give this little talk here. This is kind of my plan. If, if you don't like it, you know, we'll, we'll change it. But I'm going to give a little talk here and uh, talk about where it takes a long time to build these things. So that we're going to kind of just, you're going to have, we we'll have to use our imagination. And then um, maybe some questions. And then um, maybe I'll play a little something on something I've made for you, you know, so you can hear it. So, uh, and I have one in process right now that I'm almost done with. So that'll be, uh, I'll uh, bring that out and show you that. So we're going to start with the woods for a violin and a little bit of the history. And when I say violin, I'm going to pretty much mean all of the bow instruments that you use with a bow. So that means viola. A viola is like a violin. It's a little bigger and it's pitched down a little bit lower. And then you have a cello, which is much bigger. You play that sitting down. And then you have the double bass, which is a big stand-up bass. And the deal is, is that there are, in basic music harmony, there's four voices. There's soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. And the violin covers the soprano voice and the high alto. The viola covers the low alto and the high tenor. And the cello and double bass cover the bass, the, the, the low, you know, the baritone and the bass section. So, and that's, those are the basic, that, those four instruments basically cover the whole uh, gambit of, of sound. And, wet, and then we're talking about Western music here, basically. So the, this is a, wet, these instruments are a Western thing. Having a bowed instrument is not a Western thing. That's a worldwide thing. And a bowed instrument, we've always thought that it, the inspiration came from a cricket who like takes his leg and draws it across his body for, or, or rubs their legs together. And, do, you know, insects, they would do those kind of things. Uh, the first violin basically showed up in its present form, which is a smaller form in the early 1500s. Uh, the, the earliest existing one is from about 1530. And that's actually in the, uh, in the music museum in uh, Vermilion, uh, South Dakota. And it was made by a fella by the name of Andrea Amati. And the Amati family was a very important making family. And they're the ones that eventually taught Stradivari, who was the 
very famous maker uh, who, who lived uh, from the, in the late 1600s to the basically the mid 1700s. That's when he lived. Um, but before the Amadis, the, uh, the instruments were called viols. There were different types of viols and, and a lot of them were big, okay? And, and when they started making these little smaller instruments that were pitched a lot higher, they, they really became popular because they, they really grab you, they sing, they, they, they can imitate animal sounds like birds and, and things. And so uh, this is, uh, and the reason why I'm talking about how that the smaller violins is I'm leading to this other thing, which I hear a question almost on a daily basis at my shop, which is what's the difference between a violin and a fiddle, okay? Now, the word fiddle originally meant a small thing with a string on it. So when you hear this deal that, you know, a Nero fiddled while Rome burned, well, when Nero was alive, there was no violins. But there were little things with the string on them that people would plunk on and stuff like that. And they called those fiddles. So they, actually the word fiddle goes way, way back uh, before, uh, you know, the, the violin even existed. And so now when you hear the term fiddle music, you tend to think of country music. And that's usually what it is. A lot of people think that a fiddle is a country instrument. But in fact, the, the, some of the great classical players call their $10 million Stradivari a fiddle. And some of the back, hunt, back hill country guys that play their little homemade thing, they call that a violin. So a, a fiddle is a violin. A fiddle is a small thing with a string on it. And that's exactly what a violin is. So that settles that right there. How about that? Okay. All right. So now the woods, they're made out of, in general, a closed grain hardwood for the back and sides and neck. And then the top is usually a conifer or, or a softer, uh, you know, uh, conifer type tree. And in general, they almost always use uh, maple for the back and sides and neck because it's a closed grain. It's, it's a good reflective surface and it's strong. And they tend to use spruce on the top because spruce is light but strong. Now you can make a violin out of anything and I've seen them made out of practically everything on earth. And uh, I've actually heard some really great violins made out of some oddball wood. But in general, the tradition has always been uh, maple and spruce. And that's pretty much what I do. Uh, I've only made stuff uh, custom order out of, and, and, the, and the weirdest thing that I ever did was uh, one guy uh, ordered a violin, me to make him a violin out of, a, out of a, some wood from Crondelet Park in South St. Louis. And there happened to be a standing dead red maple tree there. And I knew the gal that worked for the parks department and she said, yeah, you can harvest that. So I actually took that tree, uh, some of it and uh, used it and made him a violin out of that. So anyway, um, so let's take a look at some of this wood here. The, we'll talk about the back of the violin first. The back of the violin uh, is made, can be made out of one or two pieces uh, in general. Uh, there's not a lot of difference between the two in terms of functionality. If you join up a two pieces of wood really well, it will act like one piece of wood. We want to get wood technical, which I assume that's why we're in the, wood, the Woodworkers Guild here. We will talk about the one piece back, and here's here's a piece of wood that's a one piece, one piece of wood. Oops, let me show this side. This is a little better. This is a piece of uh, curly maple, and you can see it's big enough and wide enough for somebody. You can almost see, you can kind of see the pattern right here, and it's wide enough that we can make a piece of a uh, back out of it. This is a piece of uh, silver maple that was cut in. 1890 down by Cape Girardeau and sat in a barn for a hundred years. And then a friend of mine told me about it and I got some of this wood. They wouldn't sell me all of it, but uh, it makes pretty incredible things. 
but in general, most good maple trees that you use for violins are not that big. They are actually, they're, they're actually about like so, and they have a heartwood, and a lot of times you want to avoid the heartwood. So you will end up with, <clears throat> with, a, bil with a billet like that. Okay, and this has been, this is just a wedge and it's been like sawed in half. And then what we're gonna do, we're gonna flip it out. We're gonna flip it like that and then join it in a book match fashion, okay? And here's one that here's one that's joined up in a book match fashion right here. So this is this would be your two piece back. On this particular piece here, <clears throat> the first thing that you do is you make this side you make one side flat. Okay. So what I did was I glued on a couple of pieces of wedges here, so that when I lay this down it doesn't wobble. You know, and then I could then I could plane it flat. I also use a hand tool for the joint. And the joint has to be absolutely perfect. And you want, you, because what'll happen is we're gonna be cutting this down to a thickness as thin, as, it could get down as thin as 2.5 millimeters thick. And you gotta have a really, really good joint for that to hold. Like Bill talked in his little, uh, the little show and tell, he use, he's using hot hide glue which is what we use. We use the, the regular kind of hide glue that comes from the uh, horses hide. There's a couple of other ones. There's nerve glue. Uh, and then there's also fish glue. And uh, those kind of glues are, are a little, and rabbit glue. And those are, fish glue is like a real ancient glue. A lot of people use, use it in the old days and stuff. But those, some of those glues like rabbit glue and stuff are a little bit too, they're too tough and too weird. You know, the, the regular just hide glue is really great. It creates a molecular bond among the pieces of wood and actually makes it like one piece of wood when you have a really, really good joint, okay? Okay, and so what he, uh, he was talking about, there's a pattern here and uh, we use these patterns to, to, to kind of get the shape of the violin. So we'll, uh, we'll like put the, we'll put the pattern on the wood like that and uh, you know, just like in kindergarten, we'll draw a line, we'll draw it like that, and then we'll we'll saw the shape out, okay? Um, this is the one spot where I use a power tool. I don't use hardly any power tools, but I use a power tool to uh, use a bandsaw to saw it out. But when I first learned, uh, we used a uh, coping saw and we also used a bow saw, and it, it went just fine if your blade is sharp, okay? Let me grab some things. I'll be right back. There we go. Okay, so. So here's a piece of wood. This is a piece, this is actually a piece of that Cape Girardeau wood. So this is gonna be a one piece back. Uh, and I just drew a center line so I could get my center line. And so this is this is the rough out shape of it, of it. But you can see it's still thick. This the this is the inside, so it's like perfectly flat. Okay, and I marked it in, <laughs> so I remember, <laughs> and I marked that out. <laughs> uh, so then we just start. We start carving this arch into it. This is the arch. This is just a rough, rough carved piece. This one is a little bit smoother. And, and even smoother, okay. So right at this point in time, we're, I want to talk about some of the tools, simple tools that we use for this. This is a, uh, 
This is an in-channel gouge, so it has the bevel on the inside. It has the dog leg here. So this is a uh, pattern maker's chisel. And uh, we use this to rough it out. We'll, we'll clamp that down tight. And then this, this will be used to rough it out like that. And then next, what we have, let me get this out of here, is a little finger plane, okay? This is made by Ibex, although a lot of makers just make them themselves. They can, they can just have a little, just a little small, uh, you know, piece of brass or a piece of something and they grind out all the parts. And these are really great for, for smoothing out the rough cuts from the gouge and they really make it really make it nice. You can really control it once you get the gouging done. And then, uh, and then after that, to get it smooth, we actually use scrapers. We use I use a uh, like metal scrapers, like a little round shaped scraper, and just scrape it. Uh, the French in the old days, long time ago, <clears throat> they would break a bottle and use the glass, and they'd use the edge of a glass to scrape it. Some people have used like curved files. There's been some people that use that, but I use a, a flat scraper. And it gets to the point, if you keep your scrapers super duper duper sharp, you actually don't even really need any sandpaper. You, you just at the very, very end, you can hit it a little bit, but a really, really good sharp scraper just makes everything just as smooth and just as great. It's just fantastic, you know, so. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. So, and sometimes you got to make your own scrapers, you know, and and you have to temper the steel, which is a whole other thing. But I do that. I know how to temper steel, and uh, and so that's a that's a really wonderful thing. Now, um, another thing that we have are these violin makers knives, and these are things that these are in general use them all the time, even use them to, to like, to cut the edge, you know, to slice the edge of these, to just do all kinds of different types of work. This is, these are, these are straight angled edges. We also have them where they're curved a little bit. And then we also have them like super extra thin and you need them real thin to cut the sound holes. And then we'll, we'll talk about that in, a, in just a second here. Okay. Uh, but anyway, this is another type of specialized tools. We almost always make these ourselves. Sometimes we use old files. This is this is one I made. Uh, you know, just make the handle yourself. You just cut a little, cut a little uh, uh, trough, trough in one side, and then you just glue it together and glue the thing in there. You really, it should be good and tight, but you want to be able to like put it in a vise and pull it out so that you can sharpen it real easy. So it's that's like the ideal thing, is that it's super tight in there, but you can actually remove it out of the out of the handle. And then also when you start uh, sharpening it and wearing it down, you you know you can kind of uh, start carving away this thing here to keep the same kind of amount of blade exposed outside of the handle. So that's a good, another good reason why to make, make something that you can pull, pull the, the blade out of it, okay? All right, let me get a couple more things over here. So now Bill, Bill in a show and tell, he was talking about this little, this part here called the mold. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit. This is, this is what the mold, the mold is. It's basically also uh, based off of the little, the pattern that we had that we, that we drew out that we made this, the shaped, the shaped piece like this. We also use that, use that to make this mold. And then we cut these, little sections in here and glue these little blocks of wood. And uh, Bill's was made out of uh, willow. That's a traditional wood to use because it's, it's strong. 
uh, but light. And then you can also use spruce, which is what these are spruce ones here. Okay. And what we're going to do, you, we build the ribs on this here. And so we take, uh, hold on. We take our basically our chunk of wood right there, take a slice off of it, plane it down thin. We basically plane it down to about to about 1.2 to 1.4 millimeters. Okay. And then we just we we set up a hot iron. Uh, Bill was telling me before we started that he has just a pipe with a with a flame in it with like a torch and it flames it up. Uh, I've seen people make electric ones that have a, a element inside. I actually have a commercial electric one. I also told him about in the old days, they used to just have an iron one and they would put it in the fire and they pull it out and clamp it onto, onto a vice. And what you do is they, you dip the thin piece, of thin piece of wood into the water and you put it up onto the iron and you have a strap and you pull it. And then what it does, it, it heats up the cells of the wood to the point where they're flexible. And then you bend it to the shape that you want like that. And then they hold, hold in place, okay? And you can see that this will be, this will be the part that will go in, in here, okay? And then we will glue it just here and just there. We won't glue it in the middle here. Although we will clamp it like that to get that shape. We want it to follow the shape. And then after we get this glued in here, then we will, we will prepare, I'm gonna use this side. We'll prepare the parts, the other ribs and we'll bend them to fit this and we'll glue it to this and we'll glue it to that, okay? And that will end up kind of like this. So here these ribs are glued to this. This one's glued to that. This is the upper block. That's the lower block. And then after we get this all built, then what we can do is we can knock, these are just lightly glued in. They're just tacked in. So then we can knock that glue joint loose and we can pull, take that out of there. And then we have basically the violin. You know, this is where, this is the start of the inside of the violin. Yeah, that's broken right there. But this is my, this is my demonstration model. And who knows? I think we got wild on some demonstration. I, I don't know what happened. Maybe too much wine or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so that's kind of, the ribs and how they relate to the to the back. Now, also, so we also once we get this shape here finished, then we will hollow this out on the inside because you need to finish this so you have something to measure against because on violins, they're actually kind of like an acoustical speaker, these back and the back and the front. So the middle's gonna be a little thicker. Middle's a little bit thicker in here. And on the back, that's about maybe four to 4.8 millimeters. And then it gets thinner as it goes out to the edges and it gets down to 2.5, three, 2.5 millimeters out here. It's about three-ish in there. And so what, what actually is happening is when you get to those proper thicknesses, the whole thing can kind of pulsate back and forth as it's, you know, when it's in use. So it, could, it, so it is kind of like a speaker in a way. So I have a, I have a top here that's kind of pretty far along so that you can kind of see, see what's going on here. So, so here's the outside and this is the inside. And you can see this is 
this is not thick. You can kind of see see that right there. And it's thicker in the middle here. And it and it goes out here. So and then this is the this is where the bridge is going to sit, which is where all the vibrations from the strings happen. And and the deal is the whole trick to these things is to make it so when the sound enters this piece of wood, the sound waves travel and try to make it all the way to the to the edge there. And if they can do that throughout the whole top, then the top works very efficiently in terms of amplification. So that's where we talk about what a violin is basically, is just a mechanical string amplifier. That's all it is. And that's all guitars are. And that's all any string instrument is, is a mechanical string amplifier. So the idea is to try to get as much amplification sound out of it as possible. So when it's driven in here and these are thinner out this way, then you get more, uh, you get more action, so to speak. And the thing actually does pulsate to the point where, where uh, when it's really cranking, when someone's really playing it, the, the, the air could come out of here at about 15 miles an hour, believe it or not. So it's been measured to do that. So, and really, really great violins, when you play them, you can smell the inside of them. They, they're like breathe, they're breathe, you know, they're, they're really weird. That's why these things are so mysterious because they kind of have a, they're kind of like, living things, even though they are just inanimate, uh, they're weird, they're very strange. Uh, now the sound holes, the originally on the old, old ancient instruments, all they, all they had was an opening right here, okay? And that's really the business end of the sound, is this opening right here. This other stuff out here is a little bit decorative in some ways. It might affect the really high pitches a little tiny bit, uh, but in general, they're, this is mostly the business end. They also used to have kind of a C shape, but as it turns out, this is makes the top, especially down in this area, much stronger. And so this is where we talk about the whole goal of a string instrument to be successful is to be flexible there's an intersection of flexibility and strength. And when you meet in the middle, in that middle part, you have a flexible instrument that's strong. And if the instrument is too strong, it won't be flexible. And if the instrument is too flexible, it won't be strong. So, and you won't get the perfect balance. And so that's, that's what we're always shooting for when we're making these things on a high level, okay? They do make instruments in factories and they make them uh, for student use and they're, they, they're a little more lax on that. And obviously it, you know, because they make them a lot faster and everything. So, so let me grab some more stuff. This, this is actually one, this is actually one that I have in process uh, right now, so you can kind of see these are my, that's the joints, these are the blocks, and it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's real accurately glued here. I don't know if you can kind of get a close up of that. It's hard to see, but um, you know, so that's just, it's just an example. I'm just showing it to you there. Okay. Now, And then there's the neck. So we're gonna do the neck here. The neck starts off with a block of wood, basically like this, it, and this maple. Um, and we put a pattern of the scroll, of the shape of the neck and the scroll, what we call the scroll on there, draw it on there and saw it out. And it ends up being like this. Okay, and then that's what we're going to have left over here. 
And these, these holes have been pre-drilled. You can, if you're a real accurate maker and stuff, you can get away with pre-drilling those holes. And I do that sometimes, but sometimes I just wait till the end to drill, drill the holes. And then uh, here's an example of kind of a finished, of a finished scroll. So you can see it still has that same shape that that one, but it's been cut this way and And this shape here is like the is like the shape of a nautilus, which is a very these are this is one of the strongest shapes uh, on Earth that occurs in natural in its natural state. And so, besides this being kind of a beautiful uh, thing, it's it also serves a purpose of protecting this box right here, which is where the pegs are going to go. Okay, and that box. Is, is pretty strong, but it's a little bit fragile. And it's when it's on a violin, it's hanging out in the air all the time. So this little scroll on the end is a great little thing to kind of, it's kind of like a bumper on a car, so to speak, or it's a bumper. It just, you know, it just protects it and it helps, it helps, gives it another chance in life, you know? Now, of course, if it gets whacked real hard, it's over, but, uh, but anyway, there's, that's, that's that, okay. So uh, another little detail I want to talk about here is what's called the purfling. Okay, and if, if we can see this, there's this line that goes around the shape of the violin here. And uh, that is generally made of three pieces of wood that are glued together. like that. The outer two pieces are dyed. The inner piece is, is bright white, it generally. And then it's sliced into little, uh, here it is, little slices like that. Okay, and that's, that is actually a channel, that's a, ch that's a channel. Let me, let me see if I, let me show you this here. See, you can kind of see it right there. There's a channel cut in there. And then these three pieces of wood are inlaid into this channel. They meet in the corners for a little point there. Some people call that a bee sting if they get it really sharp. Okay. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a kind of a signature of, of a violin uh, making what this does, this does a couple of different things. When, you, when a violin is kind of bumped on the edge, it kind of makes it stronger on the edge so it doesn't just split. And especially on the top, because the top is spruce, which is a, a soft and kind of uh, you know fragile wood, a little bit more fragile than maple is. But they put it on the back too. Uh, so it also outlines the shape of the instrument, and makes it look really really cool, you know, gives it a, an artistic look. And it also is kind of a border for the vibrations. So this purfling line lays about where the ribs are and that's kind of where, where the vibration stops. So it kind of fences in the vibrating surface and lets it, lets it be really tough and, and, and static on the outside and really flexible on the inside. So that's what that does. And I'm going to show you a picture here. Hold on. So a lot of people, they buy that stuff commercially, the purfling. You can buy it. It's cheap. But I'm crazy. I have to make my own. I, I like to use different types of wood, too. I generally use holly in the center because holly is really super uh, bright white. But I will do other types of wood. And then the outer pieces can be poplar or cherry, but you have to dye them black. <clears throat> and so here's a picture of me dyeing some strips of wood. Those are strips of wood right there in a solution here that I'm cooking on top of the shop stove. <laughs> and, uh, and then I laminate 
a one piece between two pieces of those black parts there. And uh, that's how I get the purfling. Uh, that, um, that black stuff right there is logwood extract and uh, mixed with ferrous sulfate. And so then and that dyes the wood. The outer pieces of wood are 0.3 millimeters and the inner piece is 0.6 millimeters. And you get that by planing and then scraping it at, to thickness. And so it's 0.3 is not much. You can actually see, see light through it. It gets like that. Okay. Okay. So I'll be right back. Hold on. So here's an example of something I'm just about finishing up. I tend to do some fancy, I don't know if we're going to be able to see it, but I tend to do some fancy things with the purfling. Uh, let me see if I can get a look at it. But anyway, um, and I make the varnish myself too from scratch. So and I got actually a picture of, uh, there's a picture of a pot of varnish cooking on a, uh, <laughs> on a hot plate in my backyard on the barbecue pit there. That's the, uh, that's the resin that, and then this is the, uh, this is the linseed oil that I'm cooking in a rusty, iron pan and that actually if you use rust the the iron adds a little bit of color to it and makes a real nice uh nice hue um, so anyway this is one that i'm in the process of varnishing right now so i'm not done with it yet i'm still working on it but i'm getting pretty far along on it and you can see You can see that, and then um, and matching ribs. So these ribs are actually matched. the The back is also book matched, like we said before. Curly maple back and sides, and uh, spruce on the top. And that's a Sitka spruce. That's what that is. I like Sitka spruce a lot. A lot of makers, they, they'll only use like European spruce, um, but I use Sitka. And I'll use the other spruces too. Now, we're gonna talk about the bow here a little bit. I don't make bows but they are uh, pretty amazing in and of themselves. They, uh, so the bow wood in general is a wood from Brazil called Pernambuco. That's the preferred wood. That's the wood that, that really makes it, uh, uh, makes it good. And it's, uh, you can carve it pretty thin and it's still really strong and resilient. This is actual horse hair right here from horses from cold climate is the best ones. And, uh, and then this part down here, this is called the frog. And the frog can be made out of ebony. This particular one is ebony with uh, sterling silver fittings and mother of pearl inside there. This was made, this bow was made by a friend of mine by the name of Lee Guthrie up in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And he's a very famous bow maker. And this bow, if you buy it, just regular is $5,000 from him. That's how good these bows are. They're fan, they're like unbelievable. And it's hard to believe that just a stick would be that valuable. But some of the old French makers, there's been some French and English bow makers that have been just the most incredible makers ever. And some of those bows sell into six figures. Some of them will be 150 to $200,000 for a bow. So that's insane. 
okay? But it's true. And uh, when you play, a bow makes a big, big, big difference, all right? And uh, so here's a violin here that I made in 1995. I want to show you this here. And uh, this is one, uh, I've had it for a really long time. You kind of see, kind of see the inlay right there. And uh, I always do something different on each one. And this is one that I play. I've been playing this for years and years and years. So, so let, me, uh, let me play you a tune. All right, first, and then we can go to questions after that. How's that? Is that okay? And uh, since uh, since yesterday was St. Patty's Day, maybe we should do something kind of Irishy stuff. I'm a fiddle player mostly, although I've had classical training. Uh, I mostly play like country fiddle, like square dance stuff, and some. Uh, I play a little bit of jazz and things like that, but. Uh, but we'll, we'll go into, uh, we'll, we'll play just a couple of little classic uh, Irish things. We'll play Wearing of the Green and the Irish Washer one. How about that? We'll see if I can do that. <laughs> Uh, let's let's do some questions. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, unmute yourself and uh, feel free to ask. I have a question. Okay, I don't understand dog, but oh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Go quiet down. Okay. How do you apply your varnish? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I apply it with a uh, with just a brush, a simple brush, a, a really good high quality one though, uh, of a camel hair, which actually is squirrel tail, uh, but it's really super fine. I mean, my brush is it's very expensive, but I take care of it. I've used it for years and years and years, and so yeah, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the more commercial makers, they use a spray uh, gun. I can do that. I mean, I know how to use a spray gun. I've done a lot of spray work and things like that, but I don't do it in this. I stay pretty old school about it, the whole thing. What resin do you <laughs> use when you cook the resin for the varnish? Yeah, so I use, uh, I make a terp terpene resin from like old turpentine. So if you take old turpentine and you boil it to where it turns to where it gets into an exothermic reaction, then it will convert into a terpene resin. And then to that, I add Damar, uh, D-A-M-M-A-R, Damar resin. Uh, and those are the two resins that I use. And then I use food grade uh, linseed oil, which I boil myself as you saw on this picture with the pan. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and then I cook the, all that stuff together for until it reaches what's called the firm pill stage, which is like when you're making candy and you put it on a cooled surface and you touch it and it stretches, makes it a little stretchy. That's uh, what I do for the varnish. So the, so the varnish is very uh, uh, simple. And, and, you know, there's all this talk about Stradivari and his varnishes 
and all those old Italian makers with their great varnishes, but there's no written account for those varnishes. And that makes me think that it must have been easy and everybody just kind of had it in their head. And so that's kind of what I do. I don't know if I'm doing what they did. I, some people think that this formula is pretty good, but it, it works. It, it makes a good durable varnish, but it needs to be also a little flexible. You don't want to put something on there that's too tough uh, and too like binds up the vibrations. You don't want to do that. You want to let the thing breathe and let it move a little bit, but you want it to be protected. You want the wood to be protected so it lasts. There's no dryer, you don't use a Japan dryer or anything like that. With I use a, I use a cobalt, a little bit of cobalt, a few drops of cobalt dryer. Uh, and that's only if I'm kind of want to do it quicker. If, if I have all the time in the world, like I'm not making something for somebody, I will sometimes not put dryer and just that it will take almost a week to dry if you don't use dryer, but it will. I mean, if you make it right, it'll dry just fine. It just takes a while which makes you go crazy. I see a question on the chat. It says, uh, how many violins do you make a year? Uh, I, can, I barely make one anymore. There was a time there when I was making quite a few, but um, I run a violin shop too, where we do a lot of re repair and restoration and a lot of other things. I wear a lot of hats and it's really hard for me to just stick with it and uh, you know make something all the time. But uh, I'd like to be making a little more than I do, but it's it's tough for me to do that right this moment. So. Mm -hmm. The violin you've got there is 25 years old, 26 years old. How long can no, this was from 95? So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how long can you play that before it needs rehabbed or will it last indefinitely? Uh, yeah, they. <laughs> They, they once in a while, they come unglued a little bit uh, sometimes because you actually glue the top on with a lighter glue than the rest of it. So that you can, these things are designed to be so you can take them apart, uh, even though they're glued together. So some parts are glued on lot more uh, in a lighter, lighter thing. But uh, they are actually built to last. If you, the thing that gets violins more than anything is harm's way. So if you keep them out of harm's way, it's, it's amazing. They will hold up really well. And I can play this pretty much what I, I, the only thing I've ever done to this really is clean it and change the strings on. It. And other than that, I've never had any issue or nothing like that, but I'm very careful about it. And, and I really make a big effort to keep it out of harm's way. We, we say in the case or in the hand, you know, and that's it. Treat, treat it like a baby. When I talk to the kids at schools, it's like treat this like a baby. So you don't leave a you don't leave a baby laying around and on a couch, or you don't you know then sit on it, or you don't leave a baby on on the roof of the car and then drive off. You know so. Uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah, and then I just saw a question right there. How do you attach the neck to the top? Okay, so. What, what you do is that you, in general, right now, the, the way people do it, they cut a mortise into the, into the body, all right? And it's, it's a kind of a V-shaped mortise and then, uh, and then fit the neck into the mortise, okay? Now, Stradivari, when he made them, they would actually glue them just to the outside of the ribs and then they would drive a square nail on the inside and hold it with a nail. That's actually the way they used to build them in the 1700s. So a lot of the uh, violins prior to 1830, and that uh, includes Stradivari because he died in 1737. A lot of those violins have square or held on with square nails. And so um, what they would do is they would saw the scroll off because the scroll is important. It's kind of your signature and it's really great. They saw the scroll off and they would put a new neck and, and do a, a mortise like, like a modern style mortise. They, would all, they also lengthened the neck after 1830. So before 1830, the necks on these things were only about this long, okay? And, that's, and then the violin technique started really taking off and really getting very uh, sophisticated, more complicated. And the, and the violinists, they demanded 
that you have a longer neck so they have more range and and more notes more notes and so so they they started making violins with longer necks or they started taking the old violins and sawed the scrolls and glued the scrolls on the longer necks so that's a uh, that's an important development and it's an important thing to know when you identify instruments you can kind of know if it has a modern neck in general it's, it has to be after 1830 How much do you sell your violin for when you've made one? They, they go for about nine thousand. You know, I I always I have a friends and family discount sometimes, so it could be a little bit less than that. They're about that. I've gotten I made a really fancy one, and I got a lot more. I've got about twenty thousand for that one, but that that was a special case in that regard. Uh, you know, so about 10, nine ten thousand these days, really, and that's really that's cheap. It sounds expensive, but think about this. If, like a, if a person like that plays in a symphony, in like a professional symphony, the base pay in a professional symphony is anywhere from sixty-five to eighty-five thousand dollars. And if you get an instrument that that gets you that job because it sounds really, really good, you're going to pay a lot of money. Some of these people will pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for a violin so they can make make it into a yeah. symphony now that's not any different than a dump truck driver paying a hundred grand for a dump truck and using it to make money but the thing is the violin if you take care of it it doesn't wear out like a dump truck so it's like it's like a better deal actually <laughs> and then when you get modern makers like me you can pick them up pretty cheap and they they sound just as good as some of the old ones just because they're not they're made the same way. I always say the technology peaked in 1705 and it hasn't changed since then. And this is really true. You can give me a violin from 1705 and I can play it just as easy as I can play this one made in 1995. So it, it, it's the same, it's a really unusual, strange thing to not, uh, you know, not be affected by technology that much. Yeah, there's not much, there's not many things in the world like that. About how long does it take to uh, build a violin start to finish? So because I do all of this stuff, like make my own varnish and my own purfling and do all this stuff by hand and everything, it takes me three to 400 hours to make a violin. Oh, I could get that down if, if I, um, you know, if I did it more and, you know, had my procedures more efficient, but I, I just don't, I, it's not like that now. So I, I translate into in calendar time. Uh, that's like, if you worked uh, eight hours a day, that would be an, a month and a half. Yeah, would, but you, you yeah. got to let uh, glue dry and varnish dry and that yeah. extends your, your calendar time way out, doesn't it? It can. It can a little bit, although the that the glue dries overnight. That's pretty good. The varnish takes a little longer. That will extend the time, not the time spent doing it, but it would. Yeah, it could expand out the time that it's done. And for me, this violin here, I've been working on this for about two years, because <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things happen. It's it's just been busy, and then the COVID and all oh, that's you know it's just like insane. So I'm getting pretty close to the finish line with that though. Yeah. Yeah. There was an earlier question. When you laminate the inlay, how do you control the thickness with the glue? So that's where the high glue comes in really great because what you do is you lay the laminate, you, you lay the glue in, and then you, you squeeze it, kind of squeeze it out like, a, like you're squeegeeing it, and then you smash it between, I smash it between thick plexiglass, like a long strip of plexiglass with a bunch of clamps on it. Some people use wood, you can use wood. And, and what that does is that that just, that squeezes everything out, but the hide glue is so great because the hide glue is like, a, it's a molecular bond. And so you don't need a whole bunch of it to really create a super strong bond, especially with those really thin pieces of wood like that. It just sticks just fantastic. And so, so you kind of squeegee it all out, clamp it down really hard, 
you clamp it for about a 30 minutes and then you open it all back up and you wipe it down uh, with, with water to kind of keep the outside of it from, because the glue will kind of seep out of the wood because it's so thin. And then you have to clamp it back again and then let it sit for a day. And then when you're done, it's just, it's perfect. Yeah. I also you, saw, yeah, go ahead. You use the same fish. gram strength glue for all the part, all the gluings. So we use full strength glue to glue the back to the ribs and the ribs to the blocks. We use a light glue to glue the top on and the fingerboard. We use a light glue to glue the fingerboard on too. So, uh, and that's so you can take all those things apart. And, and that's how we usually fix them is that we usually pull the top off of them and get into everything that way. Every once in a while, you'll have a severe uh, break on the back and you'll have to take the back off. That's more of a, that's a more rare situation with the bowed instruments. Now, now guitars, you tend to take the back off to fix them and not the top, but the violins and violas and cellos take the top off to fix them. So, so yeah, it's typical to glue something with a light glue. And, and the old saying, uh, you know, stronger than the wood itself, you don't want that with uh, string instruments. You, you want it to be like the wood. You want it to be that strong or maybe a little bit less strong than wood so that you can pop them apart. Um, when it's stronger than the wood, and we get a lot of repairs in where guys use white glues, you know, carpenter's glues, epoxies, stuff like that. It's a nightmare and it's really hard to get apart. It's hard to get it clean again. It adds way, way more time and money to the repair job and, and everything. So, and uh, yeah, so, and yeah, and like I said, the high glue is just, you know, it, it bonds molecularly. It, 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 it lets, it, it imitates the cells of the of wood cells because it's a natural kind of thing. You know, it's, it's like kind of the same structure really in a lot of ways. You're a real artist. Jeffrey, there, I'm sorry. There was another question about uh, your opinion of electronic violins. Yeah. So the electronic violins have, uh, they have uh, evolved over time. And uh, the reason, the, the deal with that is, is that violins in a lot of situations have always, have always been hard to keep up with other instruments, especially horns. And uh, so I actually took lessons from a famous jazz violin player by the name of Claude Williams. And Claude, Claude actually was Count Basie's first guitar player and uh, and it just turned out that they ended up uh, getting a different guitar player because Claude liked to play violin too, jazz violin. And they just having the big band, they just the, the violin just it just wasn't loud enough, you know. And so and that and and they got Freddie Green as their guitar player, and Claude kept playing jazz violin and in small ensembles with him and a piano player. And maybe a couple guitar players. It's not, it's really great when you're in a big orchestra. It's really hard, unless you have a microphone, to hear a violin. And so electronic violins was the next step in that. Uh, in the 70s, you had Jean Lou Ponty, this great violin player that played electric violin. You had these hard body, uh, and and the purpose was so that it could keep up with the other music. The only problem is they always kind of sounded like a mosquito, you know, they, they always had a kind of sound to them. And then eventually the pickup technology got a little better and they got into these piezo pickups that, that instead of picking up a, uh, a magnetic vibration, they picked up the, vibra the, the total vibration in the wood. And now the violin pickups and the electric violins can really sound pretty good. And, uh, and they can, you know, they can keep up with all the other loud instruments. But what the thing is in terms of violin making in the violin world, they are a little bit of a different instrument than an acoustic violin. And they're gonna, they behave a little different. They feel kind of the same and they do all that stuff, but there's just nothing quite like the sound of the wood working in a really, really fine, 
there's just nothing like like the sound of that and and you can do all the electronic manipulation in the world and sampling and all that stuff and it just doesn't quite get it you know and i'm sure they will replicate it now that there's digital and all that stuff but there's just something about having a violin one of the things that really got me attracted to the violin was the fact that i could be out somewhere where there's no electric and be out in the woods somewhere with a bunch of people and we can just play and it sounds fantastic and you just you don't need anything all you need is this you know it's really that's pretty pretty cool and it's been that way forever you know and so that's something that you can't get with the electric violins you got to have the other equipment you got to have all that stuff but i'm not opposed to them you know <laughs> we, we work on them a little bit not we're not good at electronic stuff but we're good at the we're good at the setup we can set them up and make them play really good and stuff we're not so good at fixing the wires <laughs> Uh, there's a question. Is it true that the Stradivari violins were not just masterfully made, but the nature of the wood was unique at the time? So that is, uh, that, that's, a, that's always been a big controversy. And, and here's how you put it to rest. If, if it really was the wood, then all of the violins that were made during that period of time should, should be really incredible and fantastic. And they're not. <laughs> so it's really the workmanship. When it comes to violins, it's the workmanship first, and then the wood is second. And actually, Stradivari made a, he made some, or his shop, I'm sure his sons helped him and stuff. He made some violins that were made out of willow and like really kind of basic wood and, and sold them kind of cheap. Okay. And just like probably to someone just down the street and stuff like that. And those violins, while they don't have the spectacular, you know, tiger stripe and stuff like that, they're real plain. They're incredible sounding instruments because they are made really wonderful. And, uh, and, and what is so weird about the whole thing is that Stradivari made these violins. He died in 1737. His, when he died, he had 90 violins that were not sold. So the greatest violin maker in the whole world couldn't even sell all of his instruments, which is depressing if you're a woodworker. <laughs> and, uh, and what's really crazy is his style of making, which he did pioneer some things. We could go on a whole nother hour lecture about what he did. But his, his pioneering things and all that stuff, actually fell off the way it, it, it fell out of popularity and all of the other makers and all this stuff were copying these other violins from Germany that were much older and his violins fell out of favor. And then all of a sudden the French revolution occurred. And after the French revolution, regular people were allowed to go into concerts. And then, so then they needed bigger concert halls because most of the, most of the classical music concerts were, were done in royalty, you know, in castles and in for, for the royalty and for the very rich. And so then the regular people were allowed, so they needed these big halls. And it turns out that a hundred years after he died, his violins, the way the style that he made them actually sounded great in those big uh, halls. So it was really a total fluke of human achievement, like nothing else on earth is this guy made this stuff died the stuff sat around for a hundred years basically they got tossed around or whatever and then suddenly they were they were fit right into the current thing and it's just crazy it's a, and they've been you know of course they've been famous and they're great because and everybody started copying them when you see old violins from the turn of the 1700s to the 1800s most of them look like <laughs> old German, like real puffy and weird. And they don't look like the Stradivari violins because they just, they weren't popular. They didn't make them that way. And then they, after the, after they started figuring out that, man, these things really sound good in a big hall. Then they started, uh, people started copying them a lot more. And this is, that's basically, uh, if you go to a violin making school, they're going to make you do that pattern. The Stradivari style pattern. That's what they're going to have you do. Um, 
So. Okay. Do you do anything to condition the interior part of the wood? Uh, I do actually. <clears throat> I and I do, I do the same thing on the outside. So I do it on both, and I use uh, propolis. And propolis is a thing that bees collect off of uh, trees, usually like gum trees or um, what else? There's a couple other trees that, that produce this stuff. Bees collect it and they use it to seal up their hives so that they keep the bacteria out of their hives. They, they use it as a disinfectant, basically. And they plug up all of these holes. But the way bees are wired, they don't just like stop plugging the hole up when the hole's plugged up. They just keep doing it, you know? And so they'll have these big globs of the stuff inside their hives and beekeepers have to scrape it out of there every once in a while because it just starts taking over everything. And, uh, and, I, and you can soak that in alcohol and it makes a really, really great sealer. It's really uh, nice. And that's what I use and, and I, and it smells wonderful. It's, it's just, it smells, has a smell of sweet smell of honey and flowers. And it just has a certain smell about it. And, and I do it more for the smell more than anything, because it just makes everything so sweet. It's just really great, but it does seal the wood up too, which is nice. Now how do you set the intonation on a violin? Yeah. So the standard, the standard, uh, there's standard lengths here. So the length, from the bridge to the nut, that length is basically 12 and 15 sixteenths or whatever. It's, 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 that's what that, it's almost 13 inches. And it's, I think it's 330 millimeters or something like that. I, don't, I think it's that. So that's, that's a determined length. If you, that's a very important size because when you play, the longer the string is, the, the, the longer your, your, what they call the stops, where you play the notes, those, get, those change by the string length. So if your string length is short, they'll be all closed up. And if they're long, they'll be real wide. So players that play seriously, they really need a consistent length. And that's what that is, that, that length there, that, that uh, or is it 365? It might be 365. I, I don't know. I'd have, I, I go by inches just on that. I go by millimeters on some stuff and inches on some other stuff. But anyway, uh, that's very important uh, measurement. So, yeah. How does that change when it's not a four horse violin? So what happens is then that is a, that will be a smaller, like a three quarter or half size. So these, these spaces here will be smaller, but that's, those are generally for children and children need smaller spaces. So, so they get, you, they, you get what's called, because there's no frets on these things, you get what's called muscle memory the more you work on them. So if you're playing a scale, like a do, re, mi scale. Those places where my fingers go, if you do that a hundred thousand times like I have, they will go back to that same spot, okay? And if you're a child, those spots will correspond. And when you get older, that muscle memory will be the same, believe it or not. That's really weird, but it will be. And, uh, and so uh, when you get to be a, an adult and a, where you need a full size instrument, then you know it, th that standard length will be that. Now, there are people who are small people who have very small hands. And so there are violins that are made that are a little bit smaller and they're not a three quarter size, which is more of a child's. They're, they're a little, they're like in between a three quarter and what we call a full size violin. They call them seven eighths violins. And, uh, and you'll see those and those have a shorter string length. They have a much shorter string length. But there again, those people get used to those, to that and their muscle memory, you know, after practicing, they get used to it. All right, are there any more questions out there for Jeffrey? Doesn't appear that there is. Jeffrey, thanks very much. We appreciate your time. Hey, thank you so much. I, it was an honor to speak to you folks and I'm humbled to be honest with you, to be asked to do this uh, every time. And it's, uh, thank you so much for having me. 
Sure thing. You're a true you artist. Thank you. Great job. Thank, Thank you. Uh, job. While we're still all on here, Bill Shukat, there was a question. Uh, are there any more SketchUp classes being planned? It's not on the schedule yet. Okay. You'll let us know when it is. I will. All right. Well, unless somebody else has got something, uh, that'll be it for tonight. Again, thanks to Jeffrey for uh, teaching us a little bit about violins. And we'll see you all next month. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.